Good morning. morning. As this year we're focusing on the invested life, I'm excited about what God wants to do through the investments you've made this week through Vacation Bible School. It's an exciting time. The preparation has been done. We've been praying for weeks. We'll continue to pray each day throughout the week. And after it's done, we'll keep praying for those who heard God's truth. The invested life. You know, and when you think of investments, <clears throat> there are so many ways to invest, isn't there? You know, when speaking about investing, one of the foremost investors in America, Warren Buffett, is often quoted. And he's been quoted to say, invest in companies that match your values. He said, make long-term investments over short-term ones. Take a look at the long investment opportunities and the outcome of those. And the last one I thought that was good, he said, great investors don't diversify. They have singleness, singleness of investment. You know, my attitude about investing has changed much over these past years. As a young man, I focused on my investments on real estate and companies back in the early days. But you know, as I've matured in Jesus Christ and in my faith, I found that these investments, though they're okay and to do, really do not match the most important values that I have. As a Christian, I would agree with Mr. Buffett. Invest in what matches my values. Good, good advice. I also agree that for the long term, I need to make one strong investment instead of diversifying my time, my talent, and my treasure. What stands there in singleness of thought? See, great investors stay the course. They have a singleness of heart and mind, and they don't turn their eyes right or left. They keep their eyes on the prize. You see, where you invest your time, your talents, and your treasure will identify what is at the center of your heart, the center of what's most valuable to you. That's where you will place the investment of everything that you have, your time, your talent, and your treasure. And I can tell you, knowing the Lord Jesus Christ for 50 years now, When I accepted him at 19, my values have changed. I believe that God makes it very simple in Matthew 6, 19 and 20. He makes it clear where our values should be. And he says this, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Yeah, how many times have we heard that? First time I heard it was probably in 1969, after accepting Christ as my Savior, and I started by reading through the Beatitudes, which intrigued me much about character, quality, and focus of my life. But here's what I understand. What we value is what we will invest our lives into. If I could see your checkbook or look at your calendar, I'll tell you what owns your heart. And it might be justifiable. It might be that you're a hardworking guy. I used to think if I didn't work 60 hours a week, I wasn't working enough in my young life. It might be that what we invest into that we can't afford grabs our heart and we don't let go of it. And we wonder why we're so unhappy, why we don't have God's peace or his joy or all the other fruits of the Spirit. You see, it's really about value. Value is a universal language we all operate on, isn't it? Think about it. We make decisions based on our value system, don't we? I know it sounds somewhat maybe shallow to some of you to consider everything transactional, But think about it, that's just the truth. Even our spiritual walk works in the same way. 
Just as we're called to invest in earthly things, Jesus prompts us through Matthew 6 here to store up and invest in heavenly and spiritual things as well. Herein lies wisdom. Spiritual investments are far more important than any physical or financial investment that you can make here on this earth because they last forever. There was a place called the Chicken Coop. It started, I think, in Kalamazoo. They had a saying, only one life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will last. Tremendous truth. We don't like to think about it, but it's true. We get our eyes on all this stuff, and we lose sight of eternity. As Christians, we're called to invest into our spiritual walk. And when we do, as I'm going to share this morning, everything else falls into place. So I wanted to give you four ways that you can make spiritual investments every day of your life. Investment number one is the most important. I'm going to speak most about this this morning. Time in God's presence. Time in God's presence. There's no greater spiritual reward than being replenished and refreshed by God's presence. Now, anyone that has known me very long knows that I'm a type A choleric. That's a bad combination, okay? I'll get it done. Don't worry. Just get out of my way. It'll be done. Whatever had to be done for the Lord, I was going to get her done, okay? It took a lot of years for me to figure out it's much easier if I give the wheel to the Lord Jesus Christ. (laughs) Let him put his foot on the accelerator. It makes life a lot more enjoyable. But Psalm 1611 says, You make known to me the path of life. And here's what he says, In your presence there's fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And one of my favorite verses is Psalm 91.1. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I don't know of a greater comforting verse than that. I've said many times to you, inside of God's Word, between those covers, there's over 7,000 promises that God's given to each one of us. And every one of those promises is like a blank check. God says, cash it in. Cash in those blank checks, those promises. And you'll know fullness of joy. You'll be resting in the Lord Jesus Christ. King David understood this. And here's what he declared in Psalm 84.10. Better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in your house in the house of my God, than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Now, this verse, verse 10, is a climax of the psalm, 84. The psalmist realizes that even though his time is short and he cannot remain long in the temple, it's better to spend only one day in a lowly position in the temple than to spend a thousand days elsewhere. Interesting thing to meditate on that. One of the most important spiritual exercises that you and I can engage in is to spend time in God's presence. I can't stand on this strong enough. I see people disturbed with life, unhappy with life, dissatisfied with life, and they are reaching out to do this and do that, and they lose sight that the one giver of fullness of life is presence with Jesus Christ. Amen? Even in our churches, we get so busy, God's on the back porch. And the only French I know is au contraire. That's not good. You see, when you make time to be in God's presence, you will have peace, hope, and the spiritual strength that you need for whatever the day brings you. I've learned being that I'm bivocational and own an advertising agency. I spend a lot of my day, and I could just be busy about writing campaigns, building strategies to help a client grow. Here's what I learned many years ago. I don't care what you do in life. Do this. Before you begin, ask God to join you in it. 
Before I start writing on a creative strategy for a new client, I ask God to give me his wisdom. I ask God to give me his creativity. I believe that's the reason we've had the degree of success we've had. You see, when you invite God to be in the center of everything that you do, anything that you do, it at that point becomes an act of worship. Think about it. How many times do we miss worshiping God because we leave him on the outside while we're too busy doing this, that, or the other thing? Whether you're going for a bike ride, whether you're working at the office, whether you're taking care of the kids, changing diapers, no. Okay, whatever it is, did you ask God to give you his wisdom, his ability, his appreciation that you can do it, and a thankful heart to be able to do it? The thing that he shaped you for, that only you alone do better than anybody else, every one of you shaped perfectly by God, uniquely by God, to accomplish his purpose in your life. But you must spend time with him. You must integrate him into every single thing that you do, you see. It took me way too long to learn this. See, being in God's presence usually begins with intention. Oh, there's an interesting word, intentional. Luke 4, 8 says, draw near to God, and what? He will draw near to you. And this is another one of those promises of those 7,000 promises, blank checks. Cash it in every day. Draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. <clears throat> Let me see if you identify with me this morning. Do you ever feel like at the end of a long day, just like vegging? Ah, oh, I don't want to do anything. I don't want to think about anything. I'm going to turn on the TV and just sit there and veg. It's amazing to me that sometimes, yet, I feel something's missing. I'm not refreshed. I'm not encouraged. Kind of listless, maybe. Here's what I found, that if I intentionally choose to stop vegging, everyone needs to rest now, don't get me wrong, but there's times we just veg, you know? If I'll intentionally say, that's enough, I need to go spend some time with God, either doing something, asking God to join me in it, or sometimes he says, Doug, sit at my footstool. <laughs> I need to talk to you, buddy. <laughs> All right, okay? Maybe it's in his word. Maybe it's one of my favorite Christian artists that I need to just sit there and worship God. It speaks to my heart. It speaks to your heart. At that point, I become energized, I become fulfilled. It changes my day. You know, as I read Scripture, I'm reminded of His nature and His goodness and His love. When I take time for an extended devotional and linger in God's Word, I, it's amazing how many times I hear God speak to me. I, I love to read Scripture, and then I take time in prayer. And how many times have you prayed and said, well, that's it, I'm up and I'm off and I'm going? Don't do that. It's a two-way communication. After you've meditated and you've prayed over Scripture, over things in your life, sit there until God speaks to you. Not verbally, most generally, at least never to me, okay? I feel his nudge in my heart. But he wants to encourage you and speak to you in volumes about what he wants to accomplish in your life, how much he loves you, how much he's created you for a purpose, and he wants you to find that purpose by spending time with him because that'll be a natural outflow of what you'll accomplish with your life, you see. You know, I believe that's why Satan works so hard to keep us so busy that we stay out of God's presence. He keeps us every excuse why I don't have time to read his word. Every excuse why I don't have time to spend extended time with God. I'm just too busy. We're going to have an illustration later this morning to talk about that. You know, I can testify to the fact that during the most difficult times that I've had to go through in my life, the best source of peace and strength came from being in the presence of God. Sometimes God puts us through the most difficult parts of our life that we might surrender to Him and that we might realize we need His presence. We need His strength and his power, and his feeling, his love, and his embracing, and his encouragement through God the Holy Spirit. It's the reason James once says, count it all joy. I remember the first time I read this, I said, say what? 
Count it all joy when you fall into different trials and tribulations, knowing this, the trying of your faith, what? Worketh patience or perseverance, making you stronger in God, in Christ, in your Christian faith. That you might not be like it says later in that chapter, a few verses later, you won't be tossed to and fro like the waves of the sea and the wind, John all over, but you become standfast and strong in the grace of God. So the psalmist says, I'd rather, he understood this, you see. He said, I'd rather spend some time, a day as a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of wickedness. Now, what does that really mean? He lists here, let's talk about those two ends of the spectrum. One side is a doorkeeper in the temple, right? Now, the doorkeeper or gatekeeper in the temple was basically a greeter, standing at the door, welcoming people who came in to worship. Probably, in lights of everything else going on in the temple, maybe one of the least positions in the temple. I don't believe that at all, but it might have been assumed that it was a lowly position. I believe it's an important position. I believe the gift of hospitality is unbelievable what it does to reach people. In their, and uh, and uh, sometimes we're just too busy to be hospitable, Right? It's the reason we moved to the back deck instead of the front porch in our neighborhoods. <laughs> I want to just be by myself. I don't know. That's another sermon. Okay. But at the other end of the spectrum, we have those dwelling in the tents of the wickedness. Now, what does that mean? Really, both the words dwelling and tents really indicate a lavish, rich lifestyle in the lap of luxury, at ease, having servants waiting on them hand and foot. That's what he's really saying here when you go back to what he said in the text. Basically, the psalmist has described the lowliest volunteer position in the temple and the highest position in the world. And which one does he prefer? He chooses to be the doorkeeper, the lowliest position in the temple. And I asked myself the question. I'll ask it to you. How about you? What would you pick if given that choice? Lap of luxury or the lowest part of serving God? Why do I ask that? I have people come to me and say, Pastor, this is all I do. It's not worth much. And I says, oh, really? <laughs> we have a long talk. If God shaped you, whatever it's for, do it in his strength and with his ability, and God will use it for eternity. doesn't matter. I wasn't going to say this, but I will. I get in trouble when I do this. I was planning to be a singing evangelist, right? Singing in front of hundreds, maybe even thousands of people at churches. Here's what I've learned after being here now since 2010 with Pastor Josh. It's so easy to sing the gospel standing up on stage, <laughs> preaching God's word. It's quite something else to walk with people who disappoint you every day or request more of you than you think they should. See, God wanted to change Doug. That was only in 2010. You'd think by that time I would have learned something at the age of 60, right? He says, Doug, I got more for you to learn. I want you to learn how to have really love people. I want you to learn how to walk with people instead of it being about your agenda. Tremendous change. It was only a couple of years after being here. Maybe I'm saying too much. I was sitting with, we take our family out to lunch every Sunday afternoon, all 18 of us. And I said, I was sitting there, I, said, I started chuckling. He says, you know, God has a real sense of humor. The things your dad used to judge, God gave him to pastor over. How many times do we judge things and God says, love them into Jesus' arms? I'll be the judge. You judge nobody. I'm going to love them into Jesus' arms. Amen. But it requires a change in our priorities, doesn't it? If God came to you today and gave you the option of living like Bill Gates or being the greeter at, or at Sunday school teacher at LifePoint, which would you pick? Don't, that's rhetorical, don't answer. <laughs> You'll embarrass yourself. Okay, no, I'm just saying. The psalmist here says that it would be better to pick the volunteer position at church. This is the opposite of what the world tells us, isn't it? 
But if we think about it, it really makes sense, and here's why. If you have all the money in the world, but do not have Christ as your Savior, here's what the Bible says. What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? Paul's cry in Philippians 3, 8 echoes this. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. You know, as we invest in God's presence, we gain spiritual and physical wealth. Let me talk about physical wealth. I had someone ask me, Josh did. He says, I'm curious, what do you mean by physical wealth? <laughs> and I says, good question. Not material wealth. That's the world's thinking. Here's a principle of God. When I put God in the center of my life, not only in my spiritual life, do you know what happens? The side effect is the wonderful things that come. I have all the fruits of the Spirit. Peace, love, joy. How many people, and even in the church, say, I just don't have any peace. I don't have any joy. Well, go back to principle one. <laughs> Spend time in the presence of God. You see, you'll have a spiritual, strong spiritual walk, and you'll have physical wealth. You won't have the frustrations and the turmoils and the, uh, the worries and all of the stuff that goes on in Matthew and the Beatitudes. He says, don't worry. Don't think about this. Look at the birds of the field. On and on it goes, right? We've all heard that. But that's what I mean by that. You want a life that is wonderful and a life that says, in the spiritual walk, I can love God, I can love people, I can love life. It begins and ends in principle one. Besting yourself daily in a rich relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So what's the second investment? The next three will go a little faster, okay? Godly relationships. You see, we grow in fellowship. And everything we try, Satan tries to get us to do is say, I don't need anybody else, I'll just go do my own thing. But we grow in fellowship. We need the church. We need each other in fellowship. And that's not just Bible study. That's enjoying each other, encouraging each other, getting to know each other. Standing together in the gap on God's principles, but having fun every day. Loving God. So that's surrendering to God. Loving people, that's sacrificing for people. And when I do, I'll love my life because I'll be in the center of God's will. God is relational and commands us to be relational as well. Matthew 22, 37 and 39, I just stated it. To love God with everything, that's surrender. To love our neighbors, ourselves, that is to be willing to sacrifice. And until I do the first, until I surrender to God, I'll never be willing to sacrifice for people. We must, if we love God, the outcome of that is God's agape love will flow through us to sacrifice for people. And you will have a lovable life just filled to overflowing at God's table. Building a relationship with God, loving God, and building a relationship with others, loving your neighbor. So, the key. When we grow in relationship with others in a godly manner, we invest into our spirits and into the spirits of others as well. That's what God had purposed us to do. That follows Matthew 22, verses 37 through 39. Surrender to God. Just let Him have His way. And let that Peace that passes all understanding that Philippians 4 talks about. And the fullness of the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, flow through it to us that we'll truly love our neighbor sacrificially. And you'll have fullness of life. You see, everyone needs a Paul, everyone needs a Timothy, and everyone needs a Barnabas. Let me, if you don't, haven't heard that before, let me explain. God works through each of these relationships in our lives. He uses a Paul to guide us. He uses a Timothy to help us mature. And he uses a Barnabas to challenge us. Do you, don't you love those people that challenge you to your Christian faith in your life? All right. Some days. Be honest. God gave them to you. For most of us, it's our husband and wives. It'll challenge. That's the reason he put you together. 
to challenge you to become more like Jesus Christ. It might be a boss at work. <clears throat> See, God wants each of you and me to be in these relationships here at Life Point Bible Church. It will be our continued focus. Josh and I are working on some thoughts for this fall and continuing on. We want a greater sense of community at Life Point Bible Church, not just church and more than just a Bible study. We want to develop community. I want to enjoy the people here that I'll enjoy throughout all eternity. I'm going to get to know you here first. It's going to be fun, okay? Investment number three, Christ-like character. I call this the law of displacement. More of Christ, less of Doug. A Christ-like character should be the focus and goal of every Christian. While we can never truly be like Christ, we can do our best to become more and more like Him, can't we? One of the ways God allows that is to allow us to go through trials. Romans 5, verses 3 to 5 says, Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Remember the first time I read that? Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, much like James 1. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the God, the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. And, I like God, and again, what is, the, what is that character? It's really Galatians 5, that the fruit of the Spirit is love. Joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. See, God uses the investments of number one that we talked about, presence with God. Number two, godly relationships to make us more like Christ. Time with God. Time with God's people. Our last investment is spiritual gifts. In the world, you might have a gifting or talent that you had invested into that brought you maybe a great return of investment. However, when we see this as the end, not the means, we lose sight of God's purpose for each of us in that talent and that gift. If I have a gift to do business well and it only is about money, that's a, that's, should not be God, that's not God's end in mind. But if I make the means the end, then I've lost. With your talents, the abilities that you have, is it material, materially focused or is it eternally focused? What's the ends? With all of your abilities that you have, your gifts, your abilities, your talents, what, is your, what do you see as the end of that? When I was younger, honestly, I'm always very transparent, it was about saying, I'm going to make it. I'm going to be successful. And God allowed that for some reason. But here's what I learned in my 40s. Success without significance is not success at all. It's the reason so many people that put their eyes at success is about money, about our position, about gaining this, that, or the other thing, believe that that's going to make them successful, and they realize it's empty at the end. I was feeling the same way. God made it very clear. He said, let's sit down, Doug, let's talk. His word made it so clear, and I remember the day, I remember the day that it became to me, it's about what is significant, and the only thing in life that is significant is eternity. The rest is a means to the end. Your life is a means to the end. Everything you do in this life is a means for one thing. Where will you end up? That's it. If you think that's all it is, it doesn't matter, we'll talk. However, when we see this as the end, not only the means, we lose sight of God's purpose for each of us. Here's a key. God has given each of you special abilities, talents, spiritual gifts. And he gave you those gifts with the intention of getting a return. A return. We talked last week about the three servants that had five bags of gold, two bags of gold, and one bag of gold. 
He expected a return. The one that put it in the ground and wasted it didn't get a return. He said, you wicked servant. You could have at least gotten interest on it. Is he at least getting interest on my life and on your life? Is he getting the return that he expected the moment he was, when you were still in your mother's womb and he shapes you specifically for a purpose? We all are called by God to use these gifts to honor him and bless others. As we invest these gifts, we make spiritual deposits that will reap a greater reward for us in due season, whether in this age or the age to come. An old story that I used many years ago came back to my mind here this week, so I added it in. There was a man strolling down a country lane, and he came across a stone quarry in which a number of men were working. So he asked, he went up to several of them, and he said, what are you doing? The first man irritably replied, well, can't you see I'm hewing a stone? Oh, okay. The second answered, well, without looking up, well, I'm earning about 200 bucks a day. But when the same question was put to the third man, he stopped, put down his pick, pumped up his chest. He said, if you want to know what I'm doing, I'm building a cathedral. See, the first man could not see beyond his pick. The second couldn't see beyond Friday's paycheck. But the third man saw God's purpose, the glory of God. And he was cooperating with the architect. However small his particular contribution, he was helping to construct a building for the worship of God. You know, as we close this morning, I want you to understand that all of these four investments will never happen, never, ever happen, unless we make investment number one central to our lives. And so yesterday, late, I thought of an old illustration. Some of you might have seen it before, but it was worth talking about again. Okay? This here represents your life. It could be a day of your life, a week of your life, a year of life. It could be your entire life. That's it. Okay, let's open it up and see what's in there, all right? All right. This container here represents all that cool stuff you like to do every day, you know? All the fun things that you like to do that really kind of steal your time and you wonder, where did the day go? You know what I'm talking about, all right? But you know they kind of steal your time, but you're saying, well, I don't want to give them up. I want to do them. I enjoy doing them. So in they go day after day, Facebook, 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 shopping on the internet, driving down that neighborhood looking for a new home that you can't afford, or going through a car lot seeking a new car that probably you shouldn't buy, Facebook, 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 Facebook. You got it, right? I thought so. You know, we know it's not the most important, but we don't want to give it up. Don't want to give it up. It adds spice to my life. It makes it enjoyable. I love it. But we can admit it's not critical to my life. Not really. Now, in this container, it holds what's probably important. Okay, let's talk about it. Our spouse, our husband, or our wife. Okay? Our children, grandchildren. Okay? How about our work, our vocation? That's got to be in there, right? Okay? And we all need some form of leisure. You can't work all the time. I used to tell... Any of my kids, the best way to kill time is work it to death. <laughs> they got kind of tired of hearing that. All right, Ben? <laughs> and so, but you got to have some leisure, right? So you got all this stuff, you got all the things you got to do, and then there comes God. Hmm. 
Doesn't quite fit in my life, does it? Hmm. Well, here comes the illustration. Let's talk about, let's start over. Let's try something different, shall we? Okay. And take it all out. Pour this all back into this container and start over. All right. How about we do this? How about we take and choose to start our day and our week with God? Okay, let's just say that's our priority number one. And out of that priority, we do a better job with our spouse, a better job with our children, a better job at work, and we have more fun in our leisure time. And you're saying, yeah, but what about all the other stuff? I'm not going to have any gusto left. Well, let's take a look. Let's see what happens. Here comes Facebook, 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 Facebook. Oh, there's a little fishing. There's a little bit of this. There's a little bit of that. Facebook, Facebook, Facebook. You know, I don't need that car or that house. Facebook, Facebook, Facebook. Oh, my goodness. This is the cool part. Yeah. Hey, there's still room left. You know what? When you're done... I forgot to bring it up. If this was full, I could pull all of this in and it'd still be time for a cup of coffee. <laughs> so, what's my point? I think you got it. My point is simply this. Why don't we live our lives this way? Why is everything always out of balance? We try to push all the non-important stuff in there and say, gee, I'm sorry, God, there's just no time for you to love you or to serve others. There's no time to meet with the fellows at Christian. I, can't, I, have, I, I hear this all the time, okay? There's no time. Have you determined... What are the most important investments of your life? You see, if you cleave God to the end, it never works. It'll just get pushed away. And in addition to that, there's hardly enough time for your spouse or your children. You're too tired to do a great job at your vocation or your work. Why? Because all of the Facebook, <laughs> all the other stuff is in there, right? I want you to leave here this morning understanding before God, what are the non-negotiables? What are your non-negotiables? What things, no matter what, are you going to say, this is first in my life? You see, at the end of your education, your work, your family, or your season of life, will you have accomplished what's most important for now and eternity? Only you can decide what, that, what you value most. But it will determine the end. And here's what I want you to understand. It is your priorities that will determine your capacity. What do I mean? It will be your priority to determine the capacity that you have, time, talent, and treasure to love God and invest into that. It will determine your capacity to love people and invest into them. It will determine your capacity to truly love life. Christ made it pretty easy for us to understand in Matthew 6 in the Beatitudes, Sermon on the Mount. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. All the fruits of the Spirit, the things that are fulfilling to your life, that are significant and meaningful and thrill you, that, you're, that you're, you, you sit there like David said at the end of Psalm 23, you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies, my cup runneth over. I love that verse. Do you feel like every day your cup's running over? It happens when you make God the priority, which will determine your capacity to serve him, serve others, and love life.
See, practicing the presence of Christ, I've said that since 2010 being here, is key. In the good times, practice the presence of Christ. In the really tough times, practice the presence of Christ. Daily remain in the presence of Christ, of God. And as Warren Buffett said, great investors don't diversify. They make the main thing the main thing. They have a singleness of purpose, and I pray that we with Apostle Paul will say, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I might gain Christ. My point for this morning, what you value will determine what you invest with your time, your talent, and your treasure. Look at your calendar. Look at your checkbook. It will not lie. It will tell you where your heart is at. And then ask God if that's what he wants in your life. Let's pray. Father, this week as we end this morning, first of all, we come, Father, with expectant hearts, excited, excited about Vacation Bible School. Lord, I pray for each child that's going to be here. We pray for that they will understand that Jesus loves them and they need to consider making of the most important decision of their life, and that is to have a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that you be with all of our workers and give them safety, that there will just be a great time this week of accomplishing your purpose through Vacation Bible School. We thank you for our friends from Tennessee who are here. This is just going to make it a great time. We pray that you give them a great week as they work through Freedom Builders and they minister with us here at VBS. And Lord, as they leave, we pray that you give them time to enjoy some time off and a safe trip home. Father, this morning, though, sober-mindedly, may we not forget the importance of our investment in the presence of God. That's a key investment we can make with our lives. And Father, I pray right now that you will just not let our hearts easily forget what we talked about this morning. But Lord, that you will be the center of all things, that you would provide balance to every part of our life, and that we will enjoy life greater than we could ever expect. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your purpose. We thank you for your plan. And we thank you, Father, for your presence. In Jesus' precious name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen.